Um, my name is Graham McIntosh. What a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, AI and space. There's a phenomenal uh, number of things going on in this domain, and it's hard to know where to start. It's everything from uh, intelligent robots that adapt uh, as they roam uh, a planet's surface through to uh, smart garments that, that monitor the health and welfare of, of astronauts. But what I want to talk to you about is the mountains of data that has been collected uh, in space science through decades of missions and the amazing opportunity to apply artificial intelligence uh, that you've all been hearing about, deep learning in particular, to that data in new ways. There are discoveries right before us that, be, that, that can be gleaned from that data. And uh, that's a process that's, um, that's already begun. A uh, couple of, of great examples. One's the European Space Agency, their, their Gaia initiative to plot a billion objects in 3D and using deep learning to, to find the way through all that data to identify hypervelocity stars. These are stars that are going hundreds of times faster than any of their stellar neighbors for no apparent reason. Uh, so fascinating initiative. Um, another would be right here in the Bay Area, Google and NASA uh, teaming up to use deep learning to go through the Kepler data, which is looking for planets around other stars. And they found new, new examples. And this is data that had been uh, gone over and over and over with existing traditional applications and the deep learning mechanisms were able to find more. Now there's a few reasons why deep learning AI fits so well with uh, space science. One of them, and I think it's an intuition uh, for all of us, is deep, space science is data heavy. Petabytes of images alone. And as uh, Andrew Ning, who's uh, one of the thought leaders in AI, uh, one of the greats, uh, pointed out, deep learning just keeps on trucking, right? It, it, uh, the more data it gets, the happier it is. Uh, so that's a fantastic fit. Another reason is that space science isn't just data heavy, I guess you could call it um, discovery heavy. It literally is a domain where we are physically exploring, frontier. We are going places we've never been before. We're seeing things we've never seen before. We're collecting data we need to make sense of. And you need the, the discovery component of deep learning, the way it can figure things out for itself in a creative way to help with that. Now, is creative too strong a word? I don't know. I would say probably not. Let's use an example that's similar to some previous uh, content you saw a moment ago with robots. Six-legged robot uh, to go over rough terrain, perhaps better than a wheeled um, a rover might do on, say, the sur surface of Mars. But you don't want to have these poor people programming how to move the, each limb. Just have a deep learning model to let the robot figure it out for itself. So in this case, they gave it a very simple metric. They go forward, but touch the ground as little as possible. It's a very good proxy for efficiency. The gait will be efficient if you don't touch the ground with your feet uh, more than you need to. So they set it in motion. And you know, initially, uh, it tended to be a little bit weird in its gallop. They went off to lunch and came back and found the system very proudly said, I've achieved 100% efficiency. I'm not touching the ground with my feet at all. <laughs> now you laugh and it is funny because it's like a kid. It's like a kid and that's the point. No preconceptions, no bias, voracious appetite for data, astounding ability in terms of through, throughput to try billions of different combinations that's the kind of supercharging we need to turn AI onto space science with phenomenal results. And it's on that basis that the, front, the NASA Frontier Development Lab was launched. And this is run, managed by the SETI Institute right here, again, in the Bay Area in Mountain View, across a whole series, a, a constellation of science, space science domains. 
and bringing together NASA, the European Space Agency, uh, top-tier academic institutions, and a whole uh, portfolio of corporate sponsors that make the compute possible. It's a crucible of innovation, and it's extremely exciting. I'll go through a few examples, including where we'd like to go, and then uh, sort of take you on a, a further journey that I think you're going to find interesting. So here's one example. It's uh, solar storm and solar flare prediction. Hey, solar flares have been going on for millions of years. It's just part of how the sun is. But it's only been in the last few decades that we've got electronics and satellites and GPS and the internet and wires strung across the country for power and communication. All of these systems are susceptible to the massive voltage spikes that these sorts of storms produce. If you look at, uh, it's fine writing, but if you look at that second quote, the Carrington event, which is referenced uh, in, in the report to the Department of Defense, that references a, a massive solar storm that took place in the mid-1800s. Back then, all they had really at risk was telegraph wires. But you know what? They caught fire. That's how intense these issues are. So we had one of the uh, Frontier Development Lab, or FDL, uh, as we call it, teams focus on taking thousands and thousands of images of the sun over a protracted period of time and correlating that to when the sun was quiet and safe versus volatile and potentially dangerous and creating a neural net model that allowed them to predict how severe would the storm be if it happened right now. And the correlations were very good and very promising, and we absolutely want to carry that forward. In fact, one of the concepts that we're uh, toying with is this notion of the sun tomorrow today, because there is an enormous amount of amazing work being done in video prediction by the AI community in general. You show a neural net model hundreds of hours of video, and you stop it, and you say, what do you think is going to happen? Show me what's going to happen next which is the kind of thing autonomous cars need, and so on. So we tap into that, show it, not hours, years. 12, every 12 seconds, another set of high def 4K images of the sun since 2010, nonstop. Eight years of video into a neural net model, and with that done, you say, so what's the sun gonna look like tomorrow? Now, if we're successful there, that's going to feed into all kinds of more specialized predictive models, which will make a profound difference to our uh, ability to mitigate the risks of severe solar events. So that's one example. Another is more related to NASA's uh, objective to return to the moon, not just to visit, but to stay. And if you're staying, you've got to take advantage of the resources that are on the moon. You need to take advantage of, let's say, ice water that might be hidden in the permanent shadows of craters. So we were, and you, you need excellent topographic and, and, and ge, um, geologic maps. So one other of the uh, FDL team developed a neural net model, 98 plus percent efficient, thousands of, a uh, thousand images per minute to identify and characterize craters. And, um, Another fantastic you know, development that I'd love to see taken forward, here's, here's one option, is to evolve that to not detect craters, but something that looks a whole lot like a crater. Now, those are, those are lava tube skylights. On the moon, just like on Earth, there's lava tubes, cavernous tubes left behind by lava flow. And every now and again, the ground just collapses. It creates what's called a skylight, one of those round things. Now, identifying those, and, and they're tiny. It's a pinprick of an image in amongst millions of craters. But a neural net could find them, discern the difference, and map them. Because just like on the, uh, the artist's rendition in the top left, lava tubes are phenomenal resources, a great ready-made shelter against radiation and all kinds of other things for a permanent uh, outpost. So great opportunities. Look, I mentioned that this Frontier Development Lab was managed by the SETI Institute. It's run right here in Mountain View. And that makes perfect sense, and here's why. 
The SETI Institute applies its capacity and its skills not just to radio listening on the far right, which is probably how you think of it. All of those domains of science, the same domains that I mentioned earlier that we're using AI for and FDL, they all converge on the singular mission of understanding the distribution and the potential propensity of life in the universe. So if we can amplify our efficiency in all those areas, can we use AI to really uh, accelerate and succeed in the mission to look for life, to look for signs of technologically advanced life? We think we can. We think we can. And um, I want to take you on that path, that line of thought. But I'm going to diverge a little bit in a way. To, to get you there, I'm going to do something that I don't think you're going to like very much. Uh, I'm, I'm going to poke some fun at us, humans, uh, by asking this opening question. This is the first step in the path. Has science ever said to us, hey, great news. You're more important than you thought. The answer is no. Not for thousands of years, without exception, ego bruising. Science has said the opposite thing every single time. No, you are, you know, the universe does not end at the edge of a flat earth. And, and, and no, the earth is not the center of the solar system. And the Milky Way is not the edge of the, of the end of the universe. There's millions and billions of galaxies. And we're not sort of really all that special. We're, we're just in there with everything else on Earth. We're better at some things. We're worse at others. Even that top little bit there, if I blow it up, that, that kind of evolution of our intelligence, it's not like you flip a switch. We're just in there. It's a spectrum. It's a sliding scale. That's harsh, hard to accept. But it's thousands of years of un un the, the uninterrupted message. A message which I'm going to declare to be a law. We are not special in any way. In any way. And I'm going to ask you to embrace that law, to love it, as we think through where to go next. So. The first place I'm going to take this new law is to answer Fermi's paradox. And Fermi's paradox, if you don't know it, is essentially, oh, come on. If there's life everywhere and there's civilizations all over the universe, where the heck is everyone? And the answers tend to come in two areas. Either the answer is, well, it's because we're super smart. Or the answer is, well, it's because we're super dumb. So the super smart people say, you know what, life isn't that common. Intelligent life is unbelievably rare. It might, you know, it might be just us. Or, or extraterrestrial civilizations, when they hit a certain point, they, 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 they have wars or they blow away their environment. Either way, they collapse, they disappear. It's just us. We're special. We are not special in any way. That's not the answer. The other option is we're super dumb. And I think that sounds a lot more promising. <laughs> So the super dumb option is we just don't get it. So let's explore that. Let's explore what it means to not be special in any way. We are dumb. And that, I'm going to approach this in sort of soft statistics. And there's two parts to it. Part one is that really, in terms of interstellar uh, useful communication and listening technology. We've had this under our belt for about 100 years. 100 years, it's, the bl it's not a blink of an eye. It's a picosecond in the cosmological tale time scale. So we are newborns. We are the absolute newest of newborns. So if you're a newborn and you're in the hospital, if you're that brand new baby, that means statistically it's certain that everyone else is older and smarter and doing stuff that you don't understand, clipboards and talking and lights are beeping and wires, and it's all you can do to move your head around and try to focus your eyes. 
That's us. So we don't get it. Now, we'll grow up, so that's going to improve, but it gets worse. And it gets worse in this way. Let's imagine that's the spectrum of intelligence. So I'll put a few things on it, a brick, amoeba, hydra, dolphin, chimp, homo sapien. That's us. So that's pretty reasonable, right? No. We're not special in any way. It's the law. We are not at the summit of intelligence. It keeps right on going. So that chimp can do some pretty clever things. So clever that there's no way that chimp could ever teach that goldfish to do what it's doing, ever, for all eternity. The goldfish lacks the neurological machinery to get it. And you know, it's just a 1% DNA flick, just a tiny bump between that chimp and us. And that's all it takes for us to make, let's say, an iPhone. And that chimp will never get it, ever. No matter how hard you try, neuroplasticity will take you only so far that chimp will never get cell phone tires and electromagnetic waves and semiconductors and silicon chips. You will never teach that chimp what we invented. So let's give ourselves a break and assume the universe is not infinitely complex. That means there's a line somewhere where you're smart enough to understand everything. So we know the chimp can, cannot understand the cell phone. Well, isn't that just fantastically good luck? That one little bump, 1% change in the DNA, is all, it just magically popped us over the line. We are not special in any way. There's symmetry around us. That means you could bump up the DNA another 1% and make another species that invents something else that we will never understand. We will never understand the theory behind that device, not in a million years. That device is to us what the iPhone is to the chimp, and that's just the way it is. So that line belongs somewhere else. I don't know where, but it's further up. So we'd love to move up that line. You need to get into genetic engineering, AI enhanced intelligence, whatever it is. That's a different topic for a different day. Right here, right now, how do we make sense of what's going on around us when we're not under smart enough, literally never smart enough, to understand what's really happening? Because we're newborns, and on top of that, we're probably not smart enough to get it. So what to do? If you're not smart and you're not special, nobody's beaming signals to you and dumbing it down so you'll get it. We're an infinitesimal speck in an ocean. So you have to hope that extraterrestrial civilizations are doing things, and just by chance, as a byproduct, stuff happens that you can distinguish from nature. And this is where things get serious again. AI is phenomenally good at this. AI lets you look for techno hints, just subtle anomalies, and it's absolutely win-win. Because the best case is it finds an anomaly and it is weird. It's unbelievably odd. And as time goes on, there's growing consensus, you know what, this, this could be it. Worst case is, it's an anomaly, it's weird, the scientific community does the, what it is exactly meant to do, which is just converge on it and huddle and figure it out and science move on. There's an explanation. Beautiful, love it. That's what happened with pulsars. The K1C number, that's Tabby star, you might have heard of it, that's the, the very odd star with luminosities that go up and down, everyone got very excited and that's, that's great too, it's good to know. Fast radio bursts, FRB, same deal. Those last two, those were examples of anomalies buried in data, exactly what I was talking about earlier. Buried in the data, it's just waiting. Just waiting, you think those are the only two? There's other anomalies, waiting. Waiting for us to find them. So 
Let me conclude with a, an example to take this down a level. And if there's deep learning architects out there, uh, you'll, you'll appreciate this autoencoder concept is basic, basic, basic anomaly detection. But I want to use it as an example for all of us. So uh, autoencoders have a very simple concept. You feed data in one side on the left, and its job is to replicate that data coming out the other end of the pipe as closely as possible. But there's a catch, and you can see the catch. It compresses down the number of neurons that represent that information, and it forces it to, dis to learn and to distill down the essence of what it is you feed it. So if you feed it tons and tons and tons of faces, it gets really good at just getting what a face is, all different angles, shapes, sizes, lighting, but it gets the essence. And then it can expand back up again and do a pretty good job of replicating that face. But if you gave it a car, it would do a terrible job. So that's the beauty of it. An autoencoder in neural net world is really good at replicating data that it sees a lot of. And when something's weird, it does a terrible job. That's what we want. So just as an example, uh, here's an autoencoder connected up to another component, a generative component, where you can even go further. You can give it an image after it's seen millions of faces, mess it up, and say, don't just, tell, you know, don't just replicate it. Fix it up for me at the same time. And it's seen so many faces that it can take that image and fix it. The ground truth originals in the bottom, its job at filling in that hole is at the top, and it's very tough to tell the difference because it's seen so many faces it knows what's to do. That's how good these things are. So let's imagine we have a, let's use an existing neural net. They're out there right now to detect what's called gravitational lensing. That's when you have an object so dense that it literally bends light as it flows around it just as Einstein predicted, sort of like a, a lens would do, hence the name. And they're fascinating. And there's a neural net solution out there that finds these, thousands of them. So let's feed those into an autoencoder, feed them all in, till it gets really good at knowing what they're meant to look like. So if we had, that's a real example of gravitational lensing. That sort of circular thing is actually a point of light that got bent as it flowed past the center object, which is incredibly dense. So that's pretty normal. So that means the neural net will do a pretty good job of replicating it. But what if we gave it, say, this? Well, the neural net would go and try and replicate it. And no, that, that's not the same, because there, it's missing the thing in the middle. What the heck is bending the light? So there we now have our anomaly detector. The ground truth is on the left. It kind of filled in the blanks like it did with that face with the piece missing. And go, I don't know, I replicated it, but it, it's missing this thing in the middle, so I filled that in. The difference between the two, the amount of difference is how weird it is. This is really weird. It's a lot different. And it's essentially putting its finger right on the image saying it's odd because of that. So. What is that? Is it a black hole? Is it someone manipulating gravity? What if we went back there and it was all normal? There was no distortion at all. That would be a big deal. Something had moved on. Anyway, the point is this. I'm using a simple example of data, just two-dimensional two image, simple as it gets, just so you can visually get what I'm talking about. That could be 12 dimensions of data with unbelievably tricky combinations and linkages and correlations within it. That's not going to be an auto correlation. It'll be a far more advanced neural net that can discern not something obvious like that, but totally subtle, tiny anomalies that still matter. And we're going to track them down, every single one. So in summary, the hypothesis is this, that we really aren't capable. Statistically, it's likely of understanding what's going on around us, at least not at the level of detecting civilizations. But AI is a, a very powerful tool that might allow us to look for these techno hints, these just by chance 
byproduct anomalies that prove that something is, a, is something is afoot and uh, generate new scientific information, even if it turns out that ET isn't the answer. So look, all of you are here because you're innovators. Here's the thing, you're innovators. You, your brains are wired to want to make stuff that outlives you, to make stuff that's bigger than you. And I would argue that this is as big as it gets. This is about moving on, exploring, and arguably answering the most important science question of all time. So I, I recommend you join us. So one easy way to join us, uh, first of all, there's links that you can uh, find quickly and easily. You can also join us for uh, a, a, a panel discussion that's occurring almost immediately after this as, as you eat your lunch. Uh, and I, I hope you will continue that discussion there. But in short, it's, ladies and gentlemen, onward and upward. Um, I really appreciate your attention and time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.